Hello and welcome to part 6 of creating a simple move and dodge 3D video game using the Godot game engine. My name is Colin and in this video we're going to continue making this simple 3D move and dodge game where you are a ball and you roll around a maze using keys on your keyboard. You collect coins, you avoid enemies, and if you collect all the coins in the game uh, you go to a you win screen. Of course if you hit an enemy you go to the game over screen and you can go back to the menu and try again. This is part 6 in this mini series of about nine or ten videos or so. Uh, so if you've not seen the previous five videos in this mini series, I'll put a link to that playlist on the screen right now. But in this video, we're gonna go ahead and add menus to our game. We actually have three of them to make. We have a title menu uh, with a play button. We have a game over screen and a you win screen if you collect all the coins in the game. So first off, we're gonna learn how to create menu screens in the game. Uh, next off, number two, we're going to learn how to create on-screen menu text, so text on the screen, uh, and actually be able to use whatever font that we want pretty much uh, in our game. Uh, we're going to add a background colors, so that's number three, uh, so you can have whatever background color you want in your menu. Number four, we're gonna add buttons to our menu that we can actually click or hover over that will have style and text on them. And last but not least, we're gonna program the buttons using something called signals, which allow us to click the button and have a certain piece of code execute. And that way we can switch scenes in our game when we press a button to play again or to go back to the menu. But first off, we're actually gonna fix a small error that we have in our project to do with shadows and walls. So that's number zero. That's the first thing that we're going to fix uh, in this video. But of course, if you like this video, if you learned something, go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and this channel. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this one in Godot or Blender or technology, click on that subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So let's go ahead and jump into Godot. I've got my game project open. And in the last video, we added maze walls using uh, this grid map node along with a mesh library we have two different blocks that we exported from Blender 2.8, but you will notice there is something not quite right about the walls. They are not casting shadows. My ball here is casting a shadow. This block that's going to fall when I play on my game is casting a shadow. Uh, I've got a problem with my lamp. Uh, I spent some time in the last video making uh, my scene have ambient occlusion or screen space ambient occlusion to get the, the shading kind of nicer, but if I select my directional light in my scene. Um, it has properties that I kind of messed up in an earlier video where I, I tweaked to have bad settings. Uh, one thing I will note that is if you switch into orthographic view or orthogonal view in Godot uh, versus perspective, shadows will or may not appear the right way. I think in the last video, I uh, was looking at my scene a lot through orthogonal and when you do that, your uh, ambient occlusion might not even show up at all, or your shadows, uh, depending on your graphics card. So there we go, perspective will let you see them better. But still, with my directional light selected, if I go to the inspector and change these two settings, normal bias and bias split scale, and I can just click these little circular arrow buttons to reset them, aha, see, now we get shadows back from our walls, okay? if I or reset that one too, that might be good. You might play around with these if your shadows are acting weird, uh, but uh, we should leave these at the defaults and now they hopefully are. So that's number zero done. Let's go ahead and make a new scene for the title menu in our game. So I'll press this little plus button up here. Uh, in fact, I'll go back to my level and do a quick save. Uh, when you press this little plus button and you make a new scene, you get the option once it finishes uh, saving the other scene. Uh, when you make a new scene with a plus button, you get the option to create a root node for the scene and it defaults to 3D, but a menu in this game is going to be a 2D level or a 2D scene, so I'm going to click on 2D at the top. And the first node that I'm going to create, well, actually I have a shortcut for it here, is going to be a control node, but you can just click on user interface to create that. A control node is the basis for everything that you can use in a menu, essentially. Um, this menu is the size of our game, so it's 1,280 pixels wide, because we changed that in a previous video, and it's 720 pixels 
tall because again we changed that in the previous video. Uh, to add text to our menu I'm going to press uh, or select the control node and press the plus and if I just look through all of my available nodes the control node is a category it's a node by itself because we've added one already but it's a category of the things that you might want to have in a menu and the first thing we're going to add is called a label and a label is just a piece of text on your screen so I'll select that press create and we get this tiny little label if I make it bigger and it, it does nothing um, in order to put text in it uh, I can select it and then over in the inspector I can click under text in this text box and I can type something like uh, simple 3d game and that's going to be the, the title of my game and as you can see I've got that text uh, there it's really small and it's really boring so we're going to fix that um, in this box, depending on how big you have it, um, you can align, and those are the next properties in your inspector, the text to be centered, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to align um, left and right, I'm going to make it centered, so now it's middle, uh, and then V align, I'm going to do center as well, so now the text will always be in the middle of this box. What I suggest that you do, and there are really good ways of using different types of nodes to organize a menu screen so that if you change the size of the window, the, the menu uh, pieces will all kind of align themselves very nicely. We're just going to make this for a static sized menu today, so we're not going to get into advanced layout topics. But what I suggest that you do is you change the rectangle property of your label to be the same size as the width of your screen uh, or your viewport. So what I'm going to do is go down to the rect property, rectangle of the label, and I'm going to make it size uh, 1280 pixels wide. And then it doesn't really matter how tall it is because it gets centered, but you can also drag the top as well. And that way you can make your title centered if that's what you want. Uh, fonts. Fonts are not built into a Godot game unless you put them into a Godot game. Uh, you actually need to go and get a font file and include it in your project folder uh, on your computer. So that's what we're about to do. Uh, there's a website that I suggest that you check out. I'm gonna put up. I'm gonna put it up on the screen right now. It's called FontLibrary.org, and this is a site where you can get free fonts that, for the most part, you can use in any project that you want. There are a few conditions. Uh, I believe. Leave. there's hundreds and hundreds of them you can see how many there are based on categories uh, and they're great so uh, what I suggest that you do is go up to uh, on this website the fonts link at the top and you can search by different families of fonts or different licenses of fonts there are serif fonts that have the little extra taggy bits on the end of letters that make it look old-fashioned or like a newspaper uh, so if I go to serif fonts you can see all the fonts are kind of in that serif uh, family once it loads up. Actually, you know what? It doesn't seem to be working right now, uh, but we'll just keep on moving along. Uh, you can search for a font that you're looking for, and you can explore all the different fonts uh, on this web page. You can sort them by upload date. Uh, but most importantly, if you're wanting to make a game that you're going to publish and sell and make money off of, you need to know the usage rights or the usage rules of the font. Because fonts are essentially a piece of art and you may not have permission to include that piece of art in a game project. So uh, you might need to check out what you're allowed to do with it. And generally when you download a font from this website, it'll come with a license uh, and you can search by them. Now licenses on this fontlibrary.org website uh, include everything from freeware to public domain to Creative Commons buy or Creative Commons buy share alike. And those mean that you have to give attribution. You need to say who you, who made the actual font that you're using in the credits of your game or along with your game somewhere. You might need to put the copyright of the people uh, who made the font. There are certain usage rules and I'll let you check those out. Uh, I've gone ahead and I've downloaded a few fonts for this game project. The first one is called that no go font casual it looks like this the second one is called red cost and by the way i'll put a link to all of these in the description area below this video on youtube then last but not least sometime later uh, so these are the three fonts i actually have them on my desktop they're right here but these three font files and by the way font files often end in .ttf 
and .otf. Those are common file types that will work in Godot. So, so I'm gonna select those three font files and I'm going to copy them. I'm gonna go into my project folder on my desktop and I'm gonna make a new folder uh, for fonts, not fonts, but fonts. And I'm gonna paste those three font files into that folder and I can go back into Godot and it'll import them uh, hopefully right away. And I think it already did it in the background because I already have this fonts file uh, or folder rather in my file system uh, so I can go and see them there. So how do you actually use these fonts uh, in your game on a label? Well, if I select the label and I go down to there's lots of sections for a label and its properties of text. But if I go down to custom fonts and open that up, I can enable a font and so I'll check that box. And I can't just drag a font file across uh, into there because what you're actually doing here is you're creating a resource file inside Godot uh, that's either gonna be a bitmap font or a dynamic font. And for these, we're gonna use dynamic fonts. So I'm gonna select new dynamic font. And once I do that, this is a resource. So I can click on it to expand out its little section or I could collapse it again by clicking on it. But if I expand that little dynamic font resource section, I can go into its font category. Yeah, that's pretty big and pretty confusing here. And its font data is where I can drag the font uh, that I want. So I'm gonna use uh, maybe that no go font casual in this dynamic font. And as you can see, I can see it there. It's really, really small. So I'll tweak that in a sec. If I wanna change it later, I can do it. I can just drag in another font right there. Uh, but I'm gonna see which one I like best. You know what? I think I like the first one that I had. Mm, yeah, okay. So the font that I've just made also includes its size. So if I collapse the font section, but we're still working in this dynamic font and I open up settings, I can change the size here. I'm gonna try uh, 80 font size. And there we go, it got bigger. Uh, let's make that even bigger. Let's make it 120 or so. So that's gonna be the title of my game. Um, you might want to check this use filter option depending on your font. Uh, you might smooth out the appearance of the font. You might not get as much uh, jagginess. Yeah, it'll kind of blur the edges a little bit, uh, which will really help uh, some fonts. And then you can change the color under not the fonts are not under the font tab so I can click on the name of this dynamic font and I can go down to custom colors and here I can define not only a font color uh, by clicking on the checkbox and then picking in the color picker the color that I want so I'm going to give it kind of an aqua e greeny color and I'm going to give it a shadow as well and so if I enable shadows and then give it a shadow color of oh I don't know some sort of orangey color uh, you can kind of see it there but once I enable a font shadow, there's another section called custom constants. Yeah, there's lots of little menus and sub menus and things to expand here. It gets kind of confusing. Um, under custom constants, I can enable shadow offset, shadow offset X and Y, then I can drag to offset in those two sections, uh, the shadow that I want. So I don't like orange necessarily. Maybe I'll change it to, uh, oh, I don't know maybe a pinky color. Sure, I kind of like that. Okay, so that's my simple 3D game. Uh, if you want to change the rotation of this text, that's under the rectangle or rect property. Again, this is where we changed the size earlier. Uh, here it is, um, rotation, and I can rotate around this pivot point here. And I believe you can change the pivot offset as well, although I haven't really played with that too much. So you can uh, rotate if you hold shift, I believe, or just drag in here, you can uh, rotate it more subtly than with the little dragger. Okay, so maybe I'll make that. And then I'm gonna go maybe back to the font, uh, dynamic font and change the font size to make it a little bit bigger, maybe 150. And I like that. Okay, next up are background colors. We don't want this default gray. So I'm gonna select my control, the root node of the scene again. And I'm gonna press the plus. Um, what we have to add to add a background color under control is called a color rect or a color rectangle. So I'm gonna select it, press create. It's now a child of the control, the main root node of the scene. If it's a child of your label, well, you can just drag it onto the control uh, node. Now this color rect is this little thing up here, it's a square. 
with a color. It's white, and it's on top of our title right now. Um, but we also want to not only fix that, we want to put it behind, we also want to make it the right size. So again, just like with the label, if I select color rect and I go over to its inspector and look at its properties, I can change its rectangle position. Uh, so if I moved it, I could reset it to zero and zero, and I can change its size to 1280 uh, uh, by 720. Okay, so now it's the right size. To move it behind the text, well, this scene uh, dock here and the order of the nodes determines uh, the order in which it draws elements on the screen. Even though this color rectangle is below the label, it's actually in reverse when it's drawing things on the screen. It draws things on the screen from top to bottom, and therefore the very last thing that it drew on the screen was the color rectangle, which means that it's actually on top. So if you want things to be behind, they need to be above, uh, but still maintain the same hierarchy as the label that you want on top. So I'm gonna move color rect just right up there. It's still a child of the control, but we can just switch the order by carefully dragging them. Uh, like so. And so now if I select my color rectangle, it's behind and I can go to its color property and pick a color I might like, oh, I don't know, maybe a dark desaturated um, blue of some sort. Uh, I kind of like mm, ooh, that. Okay, we're gonna use that um, and I might tweak it between now and the next video. Uh, next up are buttons, and buttons, buttons work very similarly to uh, color rectangles and labels. If I select my control root node and press plus, I can go into my control node category. Uh, buttons are under this category called base button, and we actually don't want to add this specific node. It's actually not a node, it's a category. Um, there it is, button, and button is actually a category amongst itself or onto itself, uh, but we're just gonna add the normal button under the base button under the control category, okay? So with button selected, I'll press create. Uh, it gets put up at zero, zero, so I can make it bigger and I can drag it to wherever I want. Of course, with it selected, I can go over to its properties and the first property uh, is text. So I'm gonna name this button or have it say uh, play. Okay, so there it is, play, although that looks really boring and drab. So I'm going to select my button and under, guess what, we have custom fonts again. Now, every time that you want a font of a certain size, at least in terms of the, the difficulty we're getting into in this mini-series, um, you need to make a new dynamic font. So I'm going to enable under custom fonts font, and I'm going to say new dynamic font and the text goes away because now I have to open up that dynamic font resource and go under font and drag in the font file that I want. Um, I'm gonna try uh, red cost comic and uh, drag that in there. And now I can go to it, the, the dynamic font settings. I can change the size. Let's try, I don't know, 60. I need a bit bigger, maybe 72. And we have a font on our button. And if I go change its color, I can do that, of course. Although buttons have a cooler thing about them. Uh, if I select the button and uh, go out of this dynamic font, so just click the dynamic font to uh, collapse it, buttons have custom colors for different states. We can pick a normal font color, so just the way that the uh, color of the button looks, so I can enable it and uh, let's say make it kind of a greeny yellow color because that's the color for uh, play. And I can then have a hover color, and this will appear whenever I put my mouse over the button area. So if I make the hover color, oh, let's say uh, orangey in color, uh, we won't see it right now, but we'll see it when we play the game. And I'm gonna make a color for the pressed state. So as I'm actually clicking on it, I'm gonna have it go to uh, kind of a bright pinky color kind of like that, okay? One thing we can also do is right under the basic settings of the button, so up here where you uh, set the text of it, you can make the button style flat, so you can get rid of that, uh, that ugly rectangle around the button and just have it look like text. So now if I go and play this scene, uh, it'll ask me to save it, and that's good. Yes, I will save it. Uh, I'll just call it menu.tscn and it'll be in my res project folder and save folder and save. Uh, it will play and we can see this menu and if I hover over it, it goes orange, that's the hover color, and if I click on it, it'll turn pink, 
just before it does what it's going to do. Okay, so that's how you make a menu screen. Uh, last but not least, let's program the button. So if I select my button, first thing I'll do is I'm going to give it a name. This button is on the title screen and it's the play button. So I'm going to give it an appropriate name. I'll double click on it uh, in my uh, scene doc. I'm going to call it uh, button dash title dash play. And uh, the reason I'm doing that is because if you just leave all of your buttons named button, uh, things might go awry for you if you uh, name the code always button dot dot uh, gd or the gd script font just called button because then you'll have all your buttons try to have the same kind of code. We'll see that in a sec, but we want to name them, them first. Uh, next, I'm going to add a script to this button. And when I do that, you're gonna see what I'm talking about here. Uh, it names the GD, the script file, the name of your button by default. And you can change this, but I just find it handy to name your button right away and therefore it'll name the, uh, the script file for your button the same as the actual button and that way you know which buttons code file is, belongs to which button. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we're gonna use GDScript, of course. We're going to leave it uh, inheriting code from button. Um, we're gonna have no comments uh, turned on. And I'm gonna save this script file into our scripts folder. So I'm gonna press the, the little folder button, go into my scripts folder in my uh, project folder and click uh, open, I guess. And now I can press create. So we're creating this in our scripts folder. Uh, and create. So how do you program a button to go to a different scene? Because this button of our title menu should actually jump to our game's level. Well, we're actually gonna use something that are called signals. And signals are a way in Godot that objects code can communicate with other objects code or objects can communicate with other objects. Um, where you can see and work with these signals is both in your code or either in your code uh, in a script file or if you have a node selected you can go over to the node tab next to the inspector and if you have a uh, node selected you're gonna see the uh, signals, the built-in signals that are kind of like event handlers. They're common events and reasons why you might want to have a node communicate either with itself or with another node. So with a button, you might want to trigger some code or run a function when the button is down or when the button is up or when the button is pressed. You might also want to have code run when that button becomes focused on. Uh, like if they press tab on their screen or if they do something that makes it focused um, or when you put your mouse over that button or when you take your mouse out of that button, so mouse exited. So there's lots of common reasons why events, why you might want to trigger code. You can also make your own signals and we'll get in, and we'll get into that probably a little ways after this first mini series in our simple 3D game, okay? But with my button selected under the node tab, so this node dock, I'm going to double click on pressed and I've already got a script on this uh, button, that's important. So if I double click on this press signal of our button, this window is going to pop up and it's going to be asking us, hey, we want to make a function, a little block of code. In other words, a mini program, that's what a function is, that will let us handle when a button is pressed. Now, if we're going to make a little function, we need to know what code file we're going to put that function in. And we can actually have that code file be on any object in our game. So that's how you can communicate with other uh, nodes or objects in your game by choosing the one that you want to send a signal to from this list. But we're actually going to make this button talk to itself or handle its own button press action or, or signal. So I'm going to select button title play. That's this button that we're currently working with. And it's going to make a new uh, function or a method called on button title play pressed. Button title play is the name of this button uh, without the dashes in it. And this is the name of the function that we're about to create. So I clicked here and then I'm going to press connect. And when I do that, it created a, f a new function for me. It only had this code up at the top before. Uh, and this code right now, this function will run when we click on the button. Now, before we actually replace this line eight with text, I wanna show you that at on this button title play, 
under the node and under the signals, there's groups and signals here. This pressed thing that we double clicked on a minute ago, it now has a little green pointer to a function name um, and little dots that mean uh, itself, so it's handling its own function uh, or, or uh, signal uh, handling. Uh, it's telling us what function is, is gonna be run when we uh, trigger this pressed signal. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm going to go back to my script. What are we gonna do when we press this button? That's what's gonna be line eight and anything we put in this uh, function. Well, I'm gonna use a function called uh, get underscore tree. Uh, that's gonna get basically all of the scenes that are available to me uh, in my game. And I'm gonna put a dot after that and I'm gonna say a change underscore scene. And I can just use my arrow keys to select it from the list and press enter. And I can close my round bracket. Now, what goes in these round brackets is the name of the file, the scene file that you wanna to switch to. So I'm gonna put in here double quotes and the name of the scene file actually has to start with the name of your project folder, which by the way, is always res. Okay, so this is kind of like a URL, like website path name. So we're gonna put res colon slash slash two forward slashes, and then the name of the path or file that we wanna to go to. We wanna to go to our level.tscn. In fact, if you just click on it down here, you'll see the path that we wanna to get to, and you can actually copy that, control C, and then paste it into double quotes in your code, and that code will actually work. So if I go ahead and uh, do a quick control S to save, and I go up to play this scene, if I go ahead and mouse over this uh, button, of course, you'll see it hover with the orange color. If I click, it will actually turn uh, pink, and hopefully, Aha, okay, it worked. It just took a little bit of time to load up uh, our game. So now I've switched into the game. If I go ahead and try that again, if I play this uh, menu or title screen, it will uh, work and I can press the button and it'll take a few moments to load that other scene into my game's memory. But uh, here it is. It, uh, I don't know why it's taking quite so long in this uh, take, but uh, there it works. Now, the last thing we're gonna do in this video is make this menu screen our default game screen because when you export your final game you want your game project to know that this scene should come up first and not your main level when i press this play button it's actually going to want me to define which scene is my default scene so i'm going to do that now i'm going to press the normal play button not the play scene button and it's just gonna say, no main scene has ever been defined. Select one, you can change it later in project settings under application category. So I'm gonna press select, and I'm gonna select my menu.tscn file and press open. And so now I can always use just the normal play button to get to the title screen of my game, and I can press play, and after a few moments, my main game level will load. And I can go ahead and play my game, and everything works just fine. Okay, so that will be it for this video. Of course, if you like this video, if you learned something, go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps me and my channel out. And if you wanna see more videos like this one in Godot or Blender or technology, click on that subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Check out my Facebook page at facebook.com slash borncg. On that page, I interact with you, my viewers, the most. And on that page, I also post uh, sneak peeks and previews of what I'm working on next. But that'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.